So with that being said, just sort of a, a simple introduction to prototypes and the JavaScript object model, we're now going to shift gears a little bit to talk about more JavaScript on the server and the, uh, the bookshelf library and the connects library. So you can actually just, if you search for bookshelf.js, it should uh, should be pretty easy to, to find, should be the first first result. And Bookshelf, as David mentioned, just gives a lot of structure around JavaScript objects and working with them relationally in relational databases. So a lot of similar features. It was actually heavily inspired by, uh, by Laravel's um, ORM as well as the Backbone.js, um, which is a front-end MVC library, which allows you to structure your code similar to what I was showing with the examples of the, of the prototypes where you can, instead of just arbitrarily throwing classes on your views here and there, it gives you models and collections of those models, which are supposed to act as sort of the, the single point of truth about the data for your, for your application. And then you listen to, as those models change, as you say, OK, re-render this template over here and this one over here, and not just add class here, add class there, and sort of um, pick on selectors and make this spider web of, of jQuery code. It gives more of a class-based structure to individual pieces. But an important component of that library is the models, which have a, a similar, um, similar structure to what Bookshelf models do. So if you're familiar with Bookshelf, you're pretty also pretty familiar with, uh, with Backbone.js models, and I would recommend taking a look at those. So some of the major features that it gives you are just the ability to, uh, to set data on, a, on an object, um, to call fetch, which returns an individual record from, from the database, create uh, relations as similar to what you dealt with in, in Laravel, where you can say a patient uh, set a record method and say this has one record where the record object is uh, table name health records. Uh, let's see. Has many, uh, belongs to, just stuff that you're pretty similar, uh, pretty familiar with already, but in JavaScript. And under the hood for Bookshelf, it uses a query builder called Connects.js. So that's connects, K-N-E-X-J-S.org. It's uh, a reference to the toy, if anyone's ever played with this. Um, but it allows you to, in a similar fashion to, uh, to jQuery, just sort of create a, a chain of different methods that you're calling uh, on your database rows. So you can, you start it out by saying, connects and the table name. So for example, connects uh, users, um, select which columns you'd like, uh, where, and have different where conditionals. And you can have and where, or where, where between, where not. You know, Down the line, uh, you can specify different joins between your database tables, which uh, Bookshelf uses internally to set up sort of magic around the has one, has many, belongs to, belongs to many. And so the, the combination of the two let you do pretty much what you'd be used to in, in a framework like Laravel uh, in terms of functionality working with databases. So let's go ahead and take a look at a simple example for a Express app, which makes use of these uh, models and collections of Bookshelf.js. So I've set up just a simple, simple application here. I stripped out some of the stuff um, that was initializing Express and moved that into an init directory, which I created. One of the nice things about working with Express as opposed to Laravel is that there's really not much enforced on you convention-wise. So you can create directories. It, it doesn't really give you a whole lot to work off of. Um, you've got just sort of some basic settings and then, but it doesn't care where you put them. You don't have to have a controllers directory. You don't need to have a models directory, a config directory. You can sort of create those as your, product, as your project uh, 
needs and set things up the way that makes sense most to you. So instead of having all of this express boilerplate in the main app.js, I just said app equals require init express. And so in the init, the initializing folder, I just have express here, and this requires express, calls the setup function, calls the, sets up the view engine, JSON parser, all of that. So now let's continue down. So I'm requiring the, the course instructor meeting and requirements models. So these are in a folder that I just decided to name models. It doesn't have to be that way. It's however it, it makes sense, but models is just pretty, uh, pretty common, so I would recommend it. But so let's go for the course. I think I'm using, yeah, and the examples down here are all based around the course model. So let's just take a look at that. So now, just at the first line of this model, I'm already requiring something else. So if you'll notice in Node, you should be uh, requiring, or you're going to end up requiring a whole bunch of different files that are um, located in, in different places in your application. And they're relative paths to wherever you are in your current application, unless it is a top level um, already defined as, as in you install it with NPM, like Bookshelf or Connects or Express or something. Those are not relative. Yes. Zoom, zoom in more. OK. OK, so you're going to end up requiring uh, a whole bunch of just different files in your code, which is good and bad. In, in a good way, you know where things are, and it's not sort of magic as to what's going on under the hood, um, which it can really be confusing when you have a, a very heavy uh, job or a very heavy framework like Laravel, which sort of says, we're going to take care of this so you don't have to require everything. but um, but you have to know how everything works in order to use it. Whereas in this case, it's very uh, straightforward as to where everything is. There just ends up being a little more typing. Um, just as an aside, I like to use, there's a plugin if you use Sublime Text where you can install the Node modules helper and you can start to type like instructor and it creates the relative path to where you are to, to that code file. Kind of, kind of useful. So, the course model uh, is requiring base here, and then base in turn requires a knit bookshelf. And then the bookshelf, it requires the top level uh, bookshelf, and then initializes it with the initialize connects, it, connects instance, which sets the, the client name and the connection settings for the database. So I'm just using a simple instance of SQL Pro, which, or of MySQL, I'm accessing it with SQL Pro, and it has just sort of a similar database set up as we had in the first sample application with the course catalog. So I set my connection settings here, and these are all documented on the uh, Connects.js project page as to how to set up these connections. So I now have my base model, and as I mentioned with the, the prototype chain, so that can actually be kind of a lot to, adds a lot of boilerplate to your code. So a uh, convention that has been adopted by Backbone.js and now Bookshelf.js is to add this extend method as a static property on your JavaScript objects, um, which gives it a sort of almost class-based inheritance nature where if you call extend, you can set up any of the prototype methods that you'd like here and then you can, any extra static methods that you might want, you can just set them yourselves out here. So I can extend it with, um, so if, for example, multiple models uh, needed uh, display name. And this get name. So here I'm saying, the display name for a model by default is whatever its name property is, otherwise return no name. And now on every model that is a that extends this base model, I now have a um, display name method on the prototype chain somewhere. And if I want to override it, I can just set it 
set what uh, get name would be here. And it allows you to mimic classical inheritance in JavaScript, which can be nice, particularly for things that are, uh, lend themselves to being class-based, like, like jo uh, object models. So let's jump back into the application code. So I've got uh, a route for just slash, just for my index, and then slash courses. And both of these are calling the, the render courses method. So again, um, functions are first class and can be passed as arguments to, to methods. So in this app get, I'm calling, I'm passing render courses as the argument. And render or er, functions can be set up like var, as I was doing earlier, var render courses equals function or they can be just function render courses. It doesn't make too much of a difference. You can actually have what are called named function expressions, which are var render courses equals function render courses. And the reason to want to have named functions, particularly, particularly in Node, is that it gives you a cleaner, uh, more readable stack trace. So if you have a whole bunch of anonymous functions, it will say, when you have an error in your code, you'll, you won't know which function it's calling. You'd have to look at the code uh, number and the line number. And it's sometimes easier just to visually parse when you actually have names for, for the functions themselves on the server side. So this render courses, let's call node app. So I'm listening on port 3000. And so all this is doing right here is just getting all the courses from the database. I'm not even limiting it. So it's doing a, a huge number of rows it's returning. And in order to do this, on the course model, there is a static property called collection. And so I just called, I said, create a new collection for this course, and then fetch it, and then return the, uh, the courses collection here in the promise. So internally, uh, David, in uh, the last half talked a little bit about promises and promises are used very heavily in both connects and bookshelf because it lends the it gives you the ability to have a bunch of different um, asynchronous calls and sort of join them together or fetch something and then with that call another asynchronous uh, database call and return that value and then jump to the next then and next then and then have a catch at the very end to sort of mimic asynchronous try-catch uh, behavior in, with asynchronous code. Because it, it's, you're seeing it now, but it's even harder once you start to deal with it. Asynchronous code is just everywhere in server-side JavaScript, and really to a much greater degree than you're used to if you've done JavaScript on the, on the client side. So that uh, really, really helps you out there. But just to show you the uh, debugger statement that I was talking about and the node inspector um, tools, I'm going to go ahead and throw a debugger line here in the render courses function and see where that leads me when I so node inspector can be installed by doing npm install with the G flag, which means global uh, node inspector. And it'll fetch it from NPM and install it globally for your application so you can just call it from the command line. I've already installed it, so I'll go ahead and uh, actually, you might have to wait. It'll just take, take two seconds. And what node inspector, again, allows you to do is have this headless version of the of the debugger console that you're used to when working on the client side and be able to stop just at specified points in your code, stop execution, and take a look at what's going on, which would have really come in handy if, if a feature like that, like that were available when uh, debugging your PHP code, I'm sure. So let's just take a look at that. So I can just call node inspector, and it'll say visit this URL port 5858 to start debugging. That's just the default for, for how it starts up. So I've now got, uh, there's, there's nothing going on here because I need to start, so node and pass it the debug flag and then 
app.js. So it says debugger listening on port 5858, express server listening on 3000. So we're good to go. Let me just refresh this. And now I can see the app.js code that, that I was just looking at, but here in the, in the console. So now if I try to run this, you can see it, it stops. It's just waiting because it's the entire code execution is now stopped on this debugger line that I've put in there. And I can mouse over Oh yeah. What is the what is the keyboard shortcut to zoom screen? Oh there it is. Got it. Okay. Oh, it's not liking that. So courses is really big because I'm not doing a limit clause or anything. It's just fetching the entire database of courses, which are a lot of them. And uh, so we see this object that this actually might crash the node inspector instance. It's OK, let me, uh, let me do a limit, and then we can take a look when it's not fetching hundreds of courses. So I'll kill the server and inspector and I'll do course collection query limit 20. So in Bookshelf, unlike in Laravel um, where you can just call limit directly or call any of the SQL methods that you're used to directly on the uh, on the ORM instance, anytime that you're using a uh, just SQL method, which is provided in Connects, you have to call the query uh, to sort of tap into the query chain. And this can be invoked with either a, uh, a function. So you, you can say, function this uh, limit 10. Or you call it by specifying which method you'd like to call on the Connects instance, and then which value. So we're going to do limit 20 and then set. We actually don't need a debugger here because we can just set breakpoints, and that makes it easier. All right, so let's set a breakpoint right here and try to load the page. Oh, wrong line, right here. Okay, so it stopped again. So now courses is an object with length of 20, and we can see all the different models that it's fetched from the database right here. So I've got a, a model object which has inside the attributes property on the object are all the things that it's found in the database, um, any events that have been registered. So you can register different events for, for example, when the model is being deleted or when it's being fetched, you can um, set different properties or, or modify things. There's a lot of different hooks. And these are all documented in, in the uh, Bookshelf JS documentation that allow you to do sort of anything that you really want to do um, with, your, with your models and collections. You can, they're meant to be really customizable and really easy for you to adapt them to the own needs of, of your application. But just looking through here, I can see what the different courses are available. And in this case, I actually didn't fetch with any, other, uh, with any other data other than just the courses themselves. But in similar fashion to the uh, Eloquent ORM, you can set up relations. So the course uh, belongs to many instructor. So if I go ahead and stop the application, jump to this fetch call, you can specify different, ob different options that you'd like to pass along to it. And one of them is the ability to um, load related code by specifying with related instructors, then courses. So let's go back and refresh this here and stop again. So now the courses object 
same number of models, but now each model has a uh, relations hash which has the, the instructors that it's related to. So this course, for example, which is course uh, 082, has two related instructor models. And you can already see how much easier this is to sort of visually work with uh, than when you're dealing with stuff that you sort of change the code and then try it again in PHP. The fact that you can just stop execution entirely and evaluate what's here and the, um, the con in the console, the cor uh, zoom out. Courses is, you know, what the, the local scope variables are available, and this is currently uh, the global object because, as you saw, unless you call it with a specific context, um, it's not going to have something relevant here. And then the, uh, let me show a few more examples implementing promises. So instead of doing this with related instructors here, I'm going to go ahead and move this to fetch, and then the courses, I'm going to return courses.load instructors. And then, then I'm going to call then Um, so then at this point, it, the courses object should be loaded with the instructors, which is an asynchronous action, but because we're returning it from a promise, the next value for then is whatever this asynchronous call returns, which in this case, load is a method in Bookshelf that actually returns the, the collection itself. So it's loading the instructors on there, and then you can specify if it's just one property, you can specify it as a string. Otherwise, you can do instructors and requirements as a, uh, as a method, or sorry, as an array. And then if you'd like to get really fancy and constrain any of these given uh, fetches, you can specify it as a hash with instructors and then what you'd uh, like to limit the query on. So I'd like to load all instructors on courses. Um, where, so QB for query builder, where uh, status uh, is active. And you can get really fancy with any of the related queries you'd like to build. But just for now, we're going to stick to just instructors. And we're returning that value. So then the next then should have all the courses loaded up properly. And if there was an error at any step in that chain, it would jump down to the catch. So let's go ahead and run that. So each time, unlike in PHP, one downside is that because Node is a long-running process, you actually need to stop the Node process as you update your code um, because it, the version that it's running in the runtime is the version of the code that was loaded when, when started, not uh, what you have sort of updated your code with since then. Okay, we'll set a breakpoint here, here, and refresh. Um, oh, I actually didn't refresh this page either, so it was on the old process. So you need to refresh both this and the node inspector. So now we see courses. If we just take a sample of one of these models, uh, we can see that the relations object is empty. But now, and the reason that you need to set breakpoints is, while I mentioned that you can jump into the, into the stack trace and see you know, where it's going in the app, so now I can see what's happening in, in the load method, which I've uh, defined on the collections. Um, it sort of eager loads relationships onto an already, and you can step through and see line by line where stuff is going, which is great. If you have something that's broken in your code, it's throwing some error, and you're like, I really want to see where this is going. But as soon as you run into um, something asynchronous, the, it goes to the next tick of the event loop, and you lose 
your you lose your place in the in the node inspector. So you need to say, okay, once I once I lose this, it needs to stop now at this line again, because um, if I if I kept hitting down down the stack, it would have eventually just gone away had I not set this line 22 blue break line. So now if I look at courses here, it should on relation instructors and then have the instructors attached to them. So you can see that I returned a promise from the first promise and then you can continually do that down, down the line. So um, the different promise, promise libraries, I use one called Bluebird, um, which is really useful. It, it adds a lot of niceties for uh, changing asynchronous or changing callback based code into stuff that works well with promises. Uh, but, sorry, I uh, forget what I was going to say there. Let's take a look though at the, so let's say that there was a problem when fetching something. So I have this other route defined called course. ID. So let's do course uh, two. Oh, cannot get. Oh, JSON course. And this does. Get, huh. Spell something wrong here? Oh, I'm not on 3000. I was on the Chrome Inspector tab. Okay, so let's go to course, JSON course one. And this returns just in JSON format the uh, course loaded up with uh, some instructors. But the example I wanted to give here is that I am doing JSON course ID, and in the fetch parameters, I'm specifying require true, which is an option that's documented in Bookshelf where it's saying that if I try and find this course and it's, and it's not there, then throw, throw an error. And that should be caught by the, by the catch block down here. So let's go ahead and jump back into the node inspector and try and break this and see what we get. So let's set a break here on the JSON course. All right. I'll go to JSON course and I will just put in some. Oh, did I not? Huh. It can be a little uh, tricky sometimes when you're trying to manage which which windows have been refreshed and which are, have not. Let's see. So it's calling error empty response. Hmm. Let's throw a debugger in here. Because of how uh, Node actually optimizes for the JavaScript runtime to be so fast on the server, sometimes the, uh, the Node debugger has some errors when you try and set breakpoints dynamically and you actually do need to use the debugger and not the line by line. So let's see if this gets us what we want. So I've set app get JSON course ID and I've set my debugger there in the catch statement at the bottom. Fetch require true. This should. All right, there we go, broke. So now I can see that it stopped at this final catch block because the with related, um, or because the require true is specified and there is no uh, course with ID of this large number, it threw an exception, which is now e message. And an, each error in JavaScript has a, uh, a stack property that comes along with it. So it's often useful to, for example, console log out e dot stack and I can actually see when I hit an error 
So I get error empty response. That's the message that was sent via bookshelf. But now I can take a look at the, at the call stack and see that in bookshelf, dialects, SQL model 83, this empty response error was thrown. And this is where I mentioned it's dot anonymous because it's an anonymous function. If that were a named function, you would have a better idea as to which function actually threw it without having to go into the model.js code. Uh, although it's meant to be fairly, fairly readable. So I can see that on line, what did they tell me it was? Line 83. So if options dot require and, and the response didn't exist, it now throws a new empty response error. So you can see uh, pretty straightforward how that works. And internally in, in Bookshelf, there are just a whole bunch of use of, of promises. So you can specify promise.method with the Bluebird library, which keeps the correct context of this while returning a promise. And so I have, I'm binding the value of this uh, similar to what I had mentioned earlier, but using promises, and then I can, is new, can be asynchronous or not if I want, and then I do some other things which may or may not be asynchronous, and it sort of jumps down this, uh, so promise.all is a helper that a lot of popular libraries have where you can have an array of potentially may or may not be promises, and once all those are completed, you return that, and then it jumps to the next line, and, and you can see how it really flattens out the pyramid that you get the callback hell as it's known, if you're doing everything with callbacks line by line. There are ways to get around that, but promises are one of the, one of the best ways, in my opinion, to, to uh, really keep your code clean and easy to read. So that is just a, uh, a short introduction to JavaScript and to Bookshelf and Connects in general. And uh, if there's any questions, I know it's a ton of material to uh, to sort of try and cover, especially since the language is unlike most that you're familiar with. So I just wanted to make it so that at least if you're having problems with your code, you can sort of jump in. That's what I like to do is sort of jump into the, the libraries that I'm using and see how things are structured. There's uh, one that I had mentioned earlier called uh, backbone.js and actually it's for use on the, on the client side to help give model view uh, controller structure to your code, but it actually has annotated, um, an, annotated documentation source, which allows you to sort of see, it's really well documented what's going on, how it's augmenting the, uh, the AJAX functionality or the event functionality or the, the models and, and collections sort of explaining what's going on in the process. And if you understand the basics of JavaScript, like the prototypal inheritance and just how functions are used as both objects and values and classes and everything, it makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on potentially in the libraries that you're using and debug your code and uh, be able to not be banging your head against the wall because you don't understand how the different pieces are working. So.